in 1996 at Comdex. Intel CEO at the time, the late Andy Grove, said this about the future of microprocessors. Our best estimates, based upon past performance, existing technology and the laws of physics, show that the microprocessor of 2011 will run at 10 gigahertz. It wasn't just Intel CEO who was convinced of this rather optimistic prospect. If we look at a few articles from that period discussing the possibility of 10 gigahertz processors by 2011, we find great insight from analysts and commentators alike. Rob Hughes from Geek.com considered Grove's prediction to be underestimating the potential for microprocessors and expected processors running at 128 gigahertz by 2011. The top comment in this article points out that if 10 gigahertz is the best that Intel can do by 2011, AMD or somebody else is going to eat their lunch. If we go over to Anantech in an article from December of 2000, Anand himself expected a 10 gigahertz processor by 2005. If you're old enough to remember the late 90s, then all this optimism won't seem so out of place. There's something to be said about how the events of the last 20 years have shaped society's outlook today. A period of widespread terrorism, globalization and the competitiveness and global awareness that that brought to the market, the explosive growth of the internet and many other events have made Western societies in particular a lot more pessimistic today, more risk averse and some of that naive hope for the future seems to have gone away in the tech world as well. I too have made some bold claims in my past videos, many that I got right, but many that will probably seem silly in a few years. In my video Hardware Trends, How Many Cores Do We Need, from a couple of months ago I talked about the limitations of many core CPUs, and one of the most popular comments pointed to another often misquoted prediction from years back. Nobody will ever need more than 640k of RAM, which the commenter changed to 32 cores given my claims in the video that we won't get much of a performance increase on the desktop once we go past 32 cores for most applications. By the way, this quote is often misattributed to Bill Gates but there is actually no record of him or anyone else ever saying this. As for my video, I explain how many cores can we really benefit from and on which types of applications and I encourage you to watch it if you haven't. I welcome any opinions that are contrary to my own. The last thing I should do as an analyst is see other people as antagonists simply because they disagree with me. How can I get different perspectives and further my knowledge if I disregard other people's views? So I thought I'd revisit the topic of many core CPUs and discuss how Intel and AMD plan to overcome the limitations of many core CPUs in the current software environment and how they will take microprocessor performance to a whole new level in the next two years. I think it's time for me to make some wild predictions of my own. I've shown this graph before and it's come to represent what people in this industry call the end of Moore's law. We use this term more as representative of the performance wall that CPUs hit a few years ago, but Gordon Moore's original observation was actually related to the number of transistors. And looking at the graph, transistors have indeed continued to double, not every year as originally predicted, but about every couple of years now. In fact, this might come as a surprise, but there is currently no immediate immediate physical limitation for this to continue. In the next 10 years, we will have 5 nanometers, 3 nanometers, 1 nanometer and then we will probably go to picometers or whatever term suits marketing departments better. You see, even at 7 nanometers, the smallest feature is actually around 20 nanometers and that's for something like the gap between a couple of wires. Transistors themselves are much larger. So yes, this trend in the doubling of transistors will continue for at least another 10 years. Now raw performance through frequency on the other hand has stagnated and this is why people say that Moore's law has come to an end. From 2005 up until now there haven't really been any improvements and as a consequence single threaded performance is also leveling off. The efficiency of microprocessors has indeed improved significantly but here too the challenges are mounting and that leaves the final performance metric the number of cores. 
levels, which stayed level for a long time but are now increasing rapidly, with AMD this year expected to launch up to 16 core mainstream processors and Intel up to 12 core ones. The problem with adding more cores is that as things stand, they are nothing more than a marketing scheme. Why? As I explained in that video from a couple of months ago, Amdahl's law shows that there is a hard limit to the performance gains that more cores can give us. With a highly parallel application like ray tracing, you only hit a wall at 4096 cores, but for the vast majority of applications, you will hit a hard limit at only 32 cores. In other words, it doesn't matter if you have 32 cores or 65,000 cores, there won't be any extra performance gains, it makes no difference to the vast majority of applications, which have the potential to only be around 50 to 70 percent parallelized, and that is of course if developers are willing to change how they code. With so many predictions in the past failing spectacularly, it's no wonder that people are skeptical of this, and that a comment like that got so many upvotes. But Amdahl's law is indeed an actual limit, it's not like Moore's law which is not really a law. However, if we could make our current code parallel, then the performance increases, even with just 16 cores, would be significant. Before we do hit Amdahl's hard limit, if only we can get software to run in multiple threads, that would give us a massive speed up, up to a double of what we're getting today. I mean, can you imagine if Intel or AMD came out and said, we have doubled the performance of CPUs? How nice would that be? Well, guess what? We might just hear such an announcement sooner than you think. There are two possible avenues for this doubling in performance using more cores. As I explained, both of them are related to parallelism in applications. In other words, making single-threaded software make use of multiple threads. The first avenue, as we were discussing, is for developers to radically change how they code. Unfortunately, even today at schools and universities, programmers are still being taught to code sequentially. Once programmers get jobs and go into the marketplace, they are expected to hit the ground running and start programming scalar software, just like they learned at university and just like the industry has been doing since at least the 1980s. Very few companies, if any, will hire new programmers and give them a few months to learn how to code in parallel just because it's how we will get more performance out of this new wave of many core microprocessors. Unless there's a specific business advantage to doing so, software houses have no incentive to spend the time and resources in changing the coding paradigm. We already have 6 and 8 core CPUs in the mainstream and yet very few applications outside of synthetic benchmarks actually make use of them. This is why waiting for a software revolution is not the solution. But there is a second option. What if processors could simply take single threaded code and make it multi-threaded automatically? There has been a lot of research work done to achieve this and no one has been able to pull it off until now. A few months ago, I was shown a demo achieving precisely this. Both taking single-threaded code and distributing it across multiple threads without the need for developer intervention, but also take badly threaded code and use a predictive algorithm that can anticipate load spikes in critical threads and distribute them more efficiently. This is artificial intelligence figuring out in real time how to better optimize code. In the early demos I was shown, in addition to the speed up of taking single threaded code and making it multi threaded. This technology also tapped into the rendering pipeline and used AI to anticipate any dropped frames, or what we call stutters, and took corrective measures to fully use threads that are inactive to take up that load. In other words, there was less stutters in video playback, there was better performance in badly coded applications that hog resources, and even in games, the rendering was much smoother. You know, how in Windows sometimes you are doing something and some random application in the background causes the system to hang for a microsecond? It's annoying and even more annoying when this happens multiple times. And then you go into the task manager and start closing down services, hoping to hit the one that's causing those random stutters. One of the things that this technology was doing was taking these spikes and evening them out across multiple threads. And it was doing this without knowing what programs were running. It was on the kernel 
nano level. The software itself wasn't changed. The company behind this technology asked me not to share too many details about it, but I can tell you that they are currently negotiating with some of the big chip makers out there to implement this on a hardware level for upcoming processors. I'll leave you to guess who those companies are. But this isn't the only recent technology to achieve this, especially on the hardware level. Back in 2014, a small startup called Soft Machines announced a new microarchitecture that it named VISC, or Variable Instruction Set Computing, whose concept was to split the workload of a single linear thread across multiple cores without the software being aware of it. In simple terms, multi-threading a single thread in hardware, rather than changing how the program is coded. Looking at the block diagram of the proposed VISC processor, we can see that it has virtual cores rather than physical cores, and you also have virtual hardware threads instead of software threads. Now, this has nothing to do with virtualization, if that's what you're wondering. They are virtual because the software is unaware of them. So at the top here, you see a single threaded piece of code coming into a global front end, which splits the codes into small pieces, which are then orchestrated into different virtual cores. These virtual cores then decide how much of the actual hardware cores they need to use to process the code. So these hardware cores are the normal cores with registers, caches, the type of cores we're used to seeing on processors. The virtual cores above them are like managers, deciding how to best allocate resources. So the result is that a single threaded piece of code can actually be dynamically distributed across multiple physical cores, even if part of those cores are being used. Now this is not the same as prediction or speculation. This is instead splitting single-threaded code and using all of the available cores, even ones that are partially in use, for a more efficient execution and a significant performance increase. Now, I have no illusions that this will make single-threaded code at 100% parallel. There are always going to be bottlenecks, and like Amdahl's law shows, the scalar part of the program will always limit any performance increases from parallelism. But the increases are there. How much faster are we talking about? According to this SPAC 06 benchmark from back when this was announced, up to 50% higher IPC than Haswell per core. So if we go back to that graph that proposes the end of Moore's law, and we recall how the number of cores is one of the few metrics that is still increasing, you can get an idea of where Soft Machines was going with this new architecture. Now why do I say was going and not is going? What happened to Soft Machines and why haven't we heard anything about this. Soft Machines was acquired by Intel in 2016. In a recent presentation, AMD's Forrest Norad said the following, As we continually shrink our processes, now we don't get any more frequency. And really, with this next node, without doing extraordinary things, we get less frequency. And he went on to say, Simply driving frequency and simply driving transistor count in a chip isn't going to cut it anymore. So what Forrest was saying here is that once you double the number of cores in the data center chips, going from 32 in Naples to 64 in Rome, because of power constraints you need to either shut down parts of the silicon, what is known in the industry as dark silicon, or, as Forrest pointed out, you have to reduce frequencies. So it's not that the Zen 2 parts are going to clock lower in a vacuum. The issue here is that the more cores you add, the lower the frequencies will be when all of those cores are in use, otherwise the chip would become as hot as a nuclear reactor. And and I mean that literally, at least in relative thermal density. But Forrest also talked about doing extraordinary things to counter this loss in frequency. Both AMD and Intel have talked about using 2.5D and 3D stacking to continue pushing performance. And I've done a video on how Intel plans to add massive amounts of cash in their future 3D stack chips to break this performance wall. Memory technology will play a big part in breaking through the current performance bottlenecks, and both AMD 
and Intel are heavily invested in new memory technologies, so there's this holistic approach to chip design that pushes a bunch of levers in concert to go beyond Moore's law. And I believe that working in conjunction with these advancements will be hardware and software-based solutions that distribute single-threaded code into multiple threads without the need for developer intervention. The implications of this will be huge, as we will potentially see massive performance gains. Whoever gets to this first will achieve IPC increases of anywhere between 50% to double the current generation of processors. As I explained, this can be done using AI on the kernel level or directly on hardware like the solution that Soft Machines presented, which now belongs to Intel. There's an added benefit to this technology. With current tech, when you brute force a metric like frequency, the power consumption increases exponential. In other words, for a small increase in performance, you need a massive increase in power. But with these thread distribution systems, the increase is linear. In the case of the software solution I showed, the overall CPU utilization goes down dramatically, which will lead in mobile devices to an increase of up to 55% in battery life. This could allow for thinner devices with the same battery life, or obviously much battery life without increasing the size of phones. In the data center, there are a couple more startups looking to provide similar solutions to accelerate single-threaded applications using hardware, like Graphcore in the UK and Cambricon in China. But those aren't really mainstream focus, so I won't discuss them in this video. So what will be the impact of this thread allocation technology in games, you might be wondering. There are several benefits. We've seen what happens when games take full advantage of the hardware available to them. In games like Doom, Ashes of the Singularity, or Strange Brigade, in the case of those games, the development teams had to specifically code for things like asynchronous compute, or code to take advantage of the compute performance in AMD's GPUs. The difference with these thread distribution technologies is that there's no need for developers to change their code. It gets optimized, at least to some extent, automatically. What impressed me most about the kernel demo I was shown was the frame time consistency. It completely removed the stutters and lag from the original Android kernel running on the same hardware. So if you thought that getting 10 GHz processors by 2011 was an ambitious prediction, here's my time to potentially make a fool out of myself, based on the potential of the technology I just discussed, and based on the topics I discussed in recent videos, I believe we will see a doubling of microprocessor performance by 2021. <laughs> That's right, in two years time you can come back to this video and make fun of me just like I made fun of Intel CEO and his 10 gigahertz processor. We'll probably start hearing about threadlets also as a definition of small pieces of single threads. So to summarize my last few videos on microprocessors, by 2021 AMD will have a 3D stacked Ryzen chip with massive amounts of next-gen DRAM on top of the CPU cores, just like Intel's Fovris technology which will come to market this year in a limited form and probably next year in larger scale. In two years time, both AMD and Intel chips will look something like this, and I expect them to include an automatic single-thread to multi-thread translation system, like the ones I discussed in this video. And all of that will result in up to a doubling in performance compared to today in a large number of applications. Now that too will reach a limit. I see it as more of a short-term boost to performance that will help sell these multi-core CPUs, but not really something that will be sustained for decades to come. As a parting note, by far the most popular video on my channel discusses how I believe ARM-based processors will steal market share in the data center, mobile and even desktop markets away from Intel. One interesting thing about the soft machine's VISC architecture that I didn't mention is that it's platform agnostic. In fact, soft machines had a demo of their prototype chip running on both x86 and ARM based systems. In other words, Intel already has the technology to create a software layer to execute both ARM and x86 instructions in the same chip, which is definitely food for thought. How can you not be optimistic about the future? 
In addition to the new adpocalypse that is going around, the European Union has recently voted to destroy channels like mine, and I have already started seeing the effects of this with some absurd copyright claims, which have obliterated my ability to make money on YouTube. Now more than ever, content creators need direct contributions from viewers if they are to survive, so I'd like to thank my awesome patrons for their continued support. It makes a world of difference, and I'd like to encourage you to join them for just one dollar per month and help keep this channel alive. If you can't contribute financially at this time, then please give this video a like and share it on social media as that really helps. Thanks for watching and until the next one.